Thanks so much, everybody, for coming today. Um, my name is Jim Ramey. I'm the executive director of Citizens for a Healthy Community. So CHC was founded in 2009 by a group of concerned Delta County residents with the mission statement of protecting people and their environment from irresponsible oil and gas development in the Delta County region. There's a lot going on right now locally. Uh, you guys probably know that, you're well aware. And we'll talk a little bit about that as um, I'm back to wrap things up after our speakers this afternoon. But we do have a great lineup here today of speakers to share their stories and share some really interesting information with you. Um, our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Carol Kwiatkowski, the Executive Director of TEDx, the Endocrine Disruption Exchange, which uh, many of you know was founded by our hometown hero, Dr. Theo Colborn, who recently passed away a few months ago today. As the Executive Director of TEDx, Dr. Kwiatkowski is responsible for developing the products and services, communication strategies, and funding support necessary to carry out the TEDx mission. The mission of TEDx is to prevent damage to individuals from the moment they are conceived through the balance of their lives by chemicals that can alter how their bodies are formed and function. These chemicals are known as endocrine disruptors. Prior to joining TEDx, she was an assistant professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Dr. Kwiatkowski will present an overview of modern day oil and gas development, and she'll discuss some of the public health concerns and share the results of our air sampling project and how our results compare to other areas in the state of Colorado. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Carol Kwiatkowski. So thank you, Jim. This is an overview of my presentation today. And Jim asked me to start with an introduction um, for people in the audience who might not have seen um, a gas well before or a frac site and don't really know a whole lot about the process, even though you've been involved in this, um, this issue for a while. So first, I'll be showing um, a lot of photos and quickly going through the stages of well development. And um, you'll see the acronym that I use on the slides is UOG for Unconventional Oil and Gas Development. I'll probably refer to that as oil and gas for the most part, so I don't have to say UOG all the time. Um, and then I'll talk some about TEDx's involvement from the beginning and why we're so concerned today about air pollution. Um, and I'll be presenting our research that was in Garfield County a few years ago and the paper we just published last week on four chemicals known as BTEX. Um, I just got a text this morning from um, someone who saw a front page uh, story on that paper release in the Grand Junction Sentinel. Yes, thanks, Susan. Um, so you might want to take a look at that. And um, the BTEX chemicals, I'm bringing them up because they are associated with oil and gas production. Um, and also because one of our main concerns at TEDx is the connection between oil and gas development and endocrine disruption. I'll be describing that and summarizing the current research on the intersection of those two issues. And then um, finally, what I know a lot of you are eager to hear about, I'll present the results of the air sampling project we conducted um, with CHC last year. And I'll go through that in detail, talking about what we found, what it means, and what we're doing next. Conventional oil and gas development, um, the way it had been done up till now, employed vertical drilling with basically limited contact with the underground formation. Unconventional oil and gas development is a result of new technology such as directional drilling and hydraulic fracturing that allow, the, allow access to fossil fuels from shale deposits, tight sands, and other geological formations that were previously not cost effective to develop. Colorado has over 53,000 active oil and gas wells. Some of those are conventional, and approximately a third of them are on the western slope. On this slide, if you can see, there's little black dots. Each of those represents a well. So what is unconventional oil and gas development? This animation, which was created by Kim Schultz from TEDx, shows a vertical well going down through the water aquifer and the other geological layers to the target formation where the gas is trapped. From one well bore, several horizontal arms can be drilled that radiate in different directions like the spokes of a wheel. This drawing shows just one horizontal spoke, which could go out as far as two miles. 
After the hole is drilled, a wire is inserted in the borehole with a long, thin cartridge on the end that contains steel ball bearings and explosives to make holes through the pipe and casing and create small fissures in the desired geological strata. These tiny cracks will be expanded by pumping millions of gallons of fluids under extremely high pressure down the hole and out of the perforations in the pipe. This pressure increases the number and size of the fissures in the formation. The sand that is pumped in with the fluid props open the fissures just enough to release tiny bubbles of gas and fluids from underground back up to the surface. I think that, uh, let's see. There you go, that's the fracking and there go the bubbles. Okay, sorry about that. Here's a photo of a well pad during drilling. <clears throat> You see the tall red and white drill rig with the buildings below it where all the operations on the pad are monitored and controlled. A thick slurry of chemicals called drilling muds is used to facilitate drilling the hole and when they come back up, they're temporarily stored in that pit that you see to the right. Once the well bore reaches the target formation, the methane, which is the natural gas, and other volatile chemicals can be released from underground. Methane is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas, and Colorado recently became the first state to regulate it. But raw gas at the wellhead contains a lot of other volatile chemicals that come up with the methane. Theo liked to call them hitchhikers, and many of those are toxic. <coughs> Here's a photo showing a section of a well pad during hydraulic fracturing. This pad had multiple wells drilled on it, at least six that I can count. You can see the row of six red Christmas trees across the top of the slide. That's what the structure of pipes coming out of the ground at the wellhead is called. Below in that photo, you see a line of tractor trailers with white cabs on the left and another on the right. These are called frack trucks, and they provide the pressure to pump chemical sand and millions of gallons of water into each well bore. The three white tractor trailers on the bottom right are sand trucks. Two million pounds of frack sand which contains a lot of crystalline silica, can be used to fracture just one well. The blue tanks in the photo are fracking tanks. They hold water for the frack and then can be used to capture the fracking fluids when they return to the surface, which is called flowback. Sometimes nearly all the flowback fluid returns, but sometimes very little of it does. Here's a photo of a frack tanks lined up with a man shifting hoses to fill the tanks. These tanks all have to be vented to release the volatile chemicals. Flowback fluids held in these tanks may be kept on the pad for reinjection, or they may be piped or hauled to disposal wells called deep injection wells or sent to open evaporation pits. Here's a photo of two evaporation pits adjacent to residences, and you can see those are really big pits. You can probably see the truck backed up to the one on the left. Let me see if I can point it out. That's a little truck right there in those pits, and there's a home right there. After the fracking process ends, each well bore will eventually be topped with what you see here. These are the Christmas trees I mentioned earlier. Methane often comes up wet or in a salty brine that also contains many other liquid hydrocarbons and volatile gases. The fluids and gases that come up with the methane have to be separated out at some point, and that process begins on the well pad. If you look up to the left in this picture, you can see a separator unit. And here's another photo of a separator unit. It's called a heater treater. The wet gas gets processed here by mixing it with a substance, usually ethylene glycol, that absorbs the water from the gas. The gases, the gases are sent through the collecting pipes while the fluids are heated to boil off the water and oils and pipe them to separate storage tanks on the pad. The water that comes up is called produced water because it's produced by the underground formation. The upper left photo shows some produced water tanks. The oily substances that come up with the gas are piped to condensate tanks. Both produced water and condensate tanks have to be vented and they need to be constantly emptied as they refill. The liquid condensate contains benzene, toluene, and other toxic aromatic hydrocarbons that are highly valued in today's economy. The condensate is delivered to huge industrial chemical plants where they are the feedstock for practically everything society is dependent upon, as you see in this list of consumer products on the slide. Now back to the well pad. After fracking is completed and the flowback fluids have been collected, 
and the gas is being separated from the fluids. The raw gas still contains a lot of volatile chemicals. If there's not enough pressure or the pipelines aren't ready, or if the economic value of the gas is not high enough, the gas is vented until everything is in place to send it to the next stage of processing. Sometimes the vented gases are burned or flared to remove some of the toxic chemicals, as you can see in this photo. This flare might be as high as 25 feet. Incomplete combustion of the flare creates yet another suite of toxic chemicals released into the air. Venting and flaring can occur for days, weeks, or even months. And flares can be extremely noisy because of the volume and velocity of the gas going through the flare stack. Once the gas leaves the well pad, it is sent to a local compressor station where it's pressurized to keep the gas in the pipeline flowing in the right direction. Each compressor station looks differently, but they can be recognized by their large fans and vents. Compressors release a lot of fugitive gases and combustion-related emissions, including benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, which I've referred to as BTEX. And then it's on to the refinery. A network of gathering pipes moves the gas to a regional processing plant where the remaining hydrocarbons and fluids are separated from the methane to produce what is known as pipeline quality dry natural gas. That will eventually enter the commercial delivery system to your homes. This photo shows one small component of a processing plant in southern Colorado. Now a word about trucks. Trucks are used to haul chemicals, equipment, sand, water, waste, and other materials to and from the well pad. It can take thousands of truck trips to develop a well, and potentially tens of thousands over the lifetime of a multi-well pad. Trucks are a source of pollution, as well as traffic, stress, and financial strain for local communities who must use and maintain the roads they travel. So that was the basic introduction to unconventional oil and gas development. What you probably already know is that it, this has impacts at the local, regional, and global level. This slide depicts these three levels, with the center representing the well pad. The yellow rings are local and regional impacts, and the outer green ring represents global impacts. At the local level, which is, I'm sure, where most of your concern is today, drilling and hydraulic fracturing pose threats to water quality, impacts on water quantity, physical impacts like traffic, noise, and light pollution, social disruption in established communities, and air pollution from many different sources. Sources of air pollution include volatile chemicals in drilling products, evaporation from drilling waste pits, volatile fracking chemicals, evaporation of flowback and produced water from pits, vents on condensate and produced water tanks, separators, compressors, venting and flaring of the well bore, fugitive emissions from pipelines, valves, pneumatic equipment, and many combustion sources such as generators and trucks. The chemicals that are emitted from these sources include methane, the natural gas, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, which are potent greenhouse gases, and other volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, sometimes hydrogen sulfide and or radioactive material depending on the formation and particulate matter, which is what you see in this photo of a dust storm that recently blew through Western Colorado. Studies in Colorado, Texas, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and other states have all attributed air pollution from one or more of these chemicals to oil and gas development. Increases in ground level ozone are also a problem attributed to oil and gas. I'm gonna leave that for Dr. Helmig to talk about since he's conducted research in this area. In 2004, TEDx began collecting data on what chemicals were being used by the oil and gas industry, and we then searched government and scientific literature for published studies on their health effects. This table shows the health effects of 353 chemicals we were able to locate in the literature, broken out into 12 categories. Nearly all of the chemicals are reported to have skin, eye, and sensory organ effects, followed by respiratory effects, effects on the gastrointestinal system, and on the brain and nervous system with a substantial number of carcinogens. 37% of the chemicals we reviewed are volatile, meaning they can become airborne. In every category but one, the volatile chemicals are more likely to have health effects than the soluble ones. And the symptoms now being reported and documented by people living near oil and gas operations match what we would expect from the more immediate effects of exposure to these chemicals. 
headaches, nausea, upper respiratory irritation, and nosebleeds. These were documented in the Colorado Incident Database. Also, fatigue, nasal irritation, throat irritation, sinus problems, burning eyes, shortness of breath, joint pain, feeling weak and tired, severe headaches, and sleep disturbance. These were part of a survey that was conducted in Pennsylvania. Given all this, in 2010, we engaged in an air sampling study in Garfield County, pictured in this photo, which has been heavily impacted by oil and gas operations from the early years of the current gas boom. This is a fairly old photo from 2008 of a small stretch of Highway I-70 between Glenwood and Grand Junction. I just want to point out the um, Colorado River is up here in the corner. And you can see how the terrain is pockmarked by well pads and the spider web of roads that need to be built to get to them, and how close it all is to the Colorado River. For our study, weekly air samples were taken over the course of a year from a stationary site in a neighborhood 0.7 miles from where a well pad with 16 wells was being built. There are also 130 producing wells within a mile radius of the sampling site. Given what we knew about the chemicals being used, we had the samples analyzed for a wide variety of chemicals, including many different VOCs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and carbonyls for a total of 153 chemicals. Over the course of the year, 61 chemicals were identified in the air samples. Shown here are the chemicals that showed up in at least half of the samples. Methane, ethane, propane, toluene, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and naphthalene were detected in every single sample. The chemicals marked in red have been referred to as the natural gas fingerprint. They're not the most dangerous chemicals health-wise, but they can be used to identify oil and gas operations as the source of air pollution. As you can see, they're found in a very high percentage of our samples. In contrast, in this rural location, we found, we've rarely found any chemicals like ethene and other alkenes, which have been sourced to road-based air pollution. One of the groups of chemicals we were particularly concerned about are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, known as PAHs. The 12 PAHs on this slide were found in our air samples in the parts per trillion range, a very low dose. But research has shown that they can have significant health effects at these low doses. The eight PAHs with asterisks in the left column were analyzed in a study done in New York City where pregnant women wore backpack monitors to measure the PAHs in the air they were breathing. When the children of the pregnant women were studied at birth, the researchers found increases in preterm births, babies with low birth weight and smaller skull circumferences among those with higher PAH exposure. As they tracked the children's development over time, they documented lower scores of mental development at three years of age, lower IQ scores at age five, and attention and behavioral problems at seven years of age, also childhood obesity. And just recently, at eight years old, in the most recently published study, they discovered reduced white matter on the left side of children's brains, slower cognitive processing, ADH behavior, behaviors, and conduct disorder. Because PAHs are usually associated with combustion and urban air pollution, we were shocked to see that in rural Garfield County, where we did our air sampling, the levels of PAHs were three times higher than what they found in New York City. This has dramatically increased our level of concern about the PAHs, particularly because they are not being monitored in areas impacted by gas operations. We're also concerned about chemicals like benzene, a known carcinogen, and toluene that were in our air samples and are commonly found near gas development. As I mentioned last Wednesday, we had a paper published on the four air pollutants referred to as BTEX. And if you recall, these have been associated with several different processes in oil and gas development, particularly with compressor station emissions. In our review, Ashley Bolden, the lead author, identified the endocrine-related health effects of BTEX. The effects shown in this slide are all from studies of human exposure, not laboratory animals, and they were all at air concentrations typically found in the environment, levels considered safe by the EPA. So now I want to share some of the other research on endocrine disrupting chemicals and oil and gas development, because the evidence for this connection is mounting as more people turn their attention toward it. Endocrine dis disruptors are hormones, are, I'm sorry, endocrine disruptors are chemicals that disrupt hormone signaling. 
Hormones are responsible for nearly all our physiological functions, including development, reproduction, thyroid function, immune function, intelligence, behavior, metabolism, and much more. Although the endocrine system is involved in every stage of life, proper hormone signaling is particularly critical for the brain and other organs as they're developing in the womb. This is where exposure to endocrine disruptors may be most devastating and when damage can be irreversible, including increased susceptibility to diseases and disorders later in life. A key feature of hormones is that they function at extremely low concentrations in our bodies, in parts per trillion even, which has been compared to a drop of water in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Likewise, endocrine disruptors can have effects at extremely low concentrations, which is one reason they're of such concern today. Some colleagues of ours published a study in December of 2013 where the researchers measured hormone properties, estrogens and androgens, in samples they collected from surface and groundwater in Garfield County. Samples were taken near wells with spills, in river water near gas activity, and also in control sites in Colorado and Missouri. They also measured hormone properties of 12 chemicals used in oil and gas operations. In a nutshell, their research identified more hormone activity in water samples from sites near gas activity than from control sites. In addition, certain chemicals known to be used in gas operations, some of which were detected at the sampling sites by another research team, displayed hormone properties similar to those found in the water samples. Given that our 2011 paper identified over 130 endocrine disrupting chemicals used by the oil and gas industry, these findings did not entirely surprise us. Another recent study in Colorado looked at the effects of prenatal exposure by analyzing 125,000 birth records in 57 rural Colorado counties. Their results showed a linear relationship, by far, how, a linear relationship between how far away the pregnant mother lived from gas wells, accounting for the number of wells also, and the likelihood of her baby having a congenital heart defect. In other words, the more wells there were in close proximity to the baby during prenatal development, the more likely the baby was to be born with a heart defect. As a reminder, 27 of the chemicals we identified in the Garfield County air samples affect the cardiovascular system. This study also found somewhat weaker evidence for neural tube defects. Another study of prenatal exposure was conducted at Cornell University. They analyzed over 20,000 birth records and compared mothers who lived within approximately a mile and a half of a well with a control group of mothers living about a mile and a half from a well that was permitted but not yet drilled. Results showed that those living near a gas well had a 25% greater likelihood of having a baby of low birth weight and 18% greater likelihood of having a baby born small for gestational age. And actual birth weights were significantly decreased. They also compared APGAR scores, which measure heart rate, breathing, muscle tone, reflexes, and color at birth. Low scores are correlated with the need for respiratory support. The prevalence of APGAR scores less than eight increased by 26% among those living near gas wells. The author points to air pollution as the most likely source and discusses polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, benzene, and other VOCs as potential causes. So now, what many of you have been waiting for, I'm gonna talk about the results of our recent air sampling here in the valley. First, a little background. In response to the study we conducted in Garfield County, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, which is a government body, responded saying that although we demonstrated that chemicals related to oil and gas development were in the air at a residence, we had not proven that human exposure had occurred. So the whole issue of health effects was irrelevant to them. We also could not prove that the chemicals we detected were not at the sampling site prior to oil and gas development in the area because we didn't have sufficient baseline data collected prior to the introduction of oil and gas, which happened many, many years ago. Um, okay, to continue. At the same time, right here in our own little valley, the BLM had proposed 30,000 acres of primarily public lands for oil and gas leasing. And although public outcry from you all twice led to the deferral of the lease sale, the threat was still there. So it was the perfect and very unique opportunity to collect baseline data in advance of oil and gas development in the area. And we knew this time we needed to collect samples from individuals, not just a stationary sampling site. 
We also wanted to thoroughly document our methods so we could replicate them in follow-up sampling and so we could provide guidance for other communities who might want to conduct similar air sampling in their areas. On this map, you can see the area where we sampled, outlined in green. Ranging from Rogers Mesa in the west, south to Crawford, out past Somerset to the east, and north over Paonia to close the loop. This is what we refer to in the next group of slides as the Delta County region, or DCR, because it encompasses parts of both Delta and Gunnison counties. So between November 2013 and July 2014, in each of the four seasons, we selected two sampling dates, three weeks apart. On each date, three locations were selected for a total of 24 samples. Locations were chosen all around the DCR, and volunteers were recruited to wear two sampling devices and a GPS unit, all housed in one backpack for 24 hours. The volunteers were asked to refrain from many activities, including agricultural burning, working with solvents, running equipment powered by combustion engines, and smoking, as some examples. And they were asked to record their activities in a logbook. A total of 74 chemicals were selected for detection analysis by an independent laboratory. This slide shows the chemicals detected in at least half of the samples. In red are the light alkanes, which are the source fingerprint chemicals for oil and gas. I'm going to read them in case you can't see them very well. It's methane, ethane, propane, isopentane, n-butane, and isobutane. And as you can see here, they were the most often found chemicals in our samples. Chemicals such as ethylene, which is on this list as well, are considered indicative of road-based combustion emissions, although combustion engines are also used on the well pads. Aromatics, such as toluene, are emitted from both oil and gas and combustion sources and are also indoor air pollutants. Naphthalene is a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, a PAH, and is the only one we detected in our sampling. Oh, I wanted to add that um, we looked at but did not see any relationship uh, between the distance from the current wells that were shown on the map in Gunnison County and the air pollutants detected in our samples. But we're going to take another look at that data and maybe run some more analysis on the levels that we found. So, in order to place the air quality of the Delta County region in the context of air quality in other regions, we compared our values with those of other areas, namely Denver, Weld County, and Garfield County. Denver, obviously, you know, has a lot of people, but it also has very few wells. Weld County is north of Denver and is home to thousands of wells, which you can see in the map where each red dot is a well. So Sarah's going to show you this a little more, but there's this yellow is Denver, the red is Weld County. They have a lot of wells. <laughs> Garfield County has a smaller population, uh, closer what to, to what you see here in this area, but it also has numerous wells. For the Delta County region, we included statistics for both Delta and Gunnison County, since most of the active wells are in Gunnison County near the border. I'm going to show you several slides. In the new slides, the, the bar all the way on the right, it says DCR underneath it, and those are, pretend those are blue so that you can differentiate them from the other regions. But all the slides are going to look fairly similar. There's Denver, Weld County, Garfield County, and the DCR is going to be all the way on the right. Okay. One of the most surprising findings was that the DCR had higher methane values than Weld County, with over 22,000 wells in Weld County. Now, this may be due in part to the fact that there are several coal mines near the border of Delta and Gunnison counties, which you know, and these mines contain an unknown number of vents that were drilled for the safety of the coal miners. They release methane and other chemicals, including ethane, pentanes, hexanes, heptanes, and BTECs directly into the air. In this slide, the light alkanes are summed, including ethane, propane, butane, and pentane. You can see that Weld County had by far the highest alkane values. Concentrations of alkanes in the Delta County region were surprisingly similar to those found in nearby Garfield County, which has nearly 11,000 active wells. As I mentioned, this may be due to the coal mine um, drainage vents. Another finding was that the um, three alkenes were highest in the Delta County region. 
Ethylene was found in 64% of our samples, but there were only three samples with detectable acetylene and only seven with propylene. Ethylene is one of several alkenes considered an urban tracer due to its presence in tailpipe emissions as a byproduct of combustion. But it's also a naturally occurring plant hormone that is involved in fruit ripening and other aspects of plant growth and development. And it's possible that the very cans we use to collect the air samples were responsible for ethylene contamination. That's what you see in these photos. But given the relatively high levels we found in some of our samples, we explored several variables in relation to ethylene concentrations, including residential land use, like was it a farm or an orchard, time spent outdoors, the season, and proximity to major roads and the railroad. But we didn't find any consistent relationships with high ethylene values. Um, it is very possible that it's a, the difference in the methodology between how we sampled our air using the SUMA canisters and how sampling was performed in the other areas. But we're looking into this further with um, the lab that we used uh, to analyze our samples. This slide shows the aromatics, specifically BTEX, which were fairly similar across the four areas. Of the four chemicals, toluene was found in every one of our samples and was particularly high in the DCR compared to the samples from the other areas. The high toluene levels may be the result of a difference in how we conducted our sampling compared to the comparison areas. We used personal air monitors worn by volunteers who spent some or all of the sampling period indoors. Studies of toluene exposure indicate indoor values are often much higher than outdoors. Toluene is one of the top 10 chemicals used in consumer products and it off-gasses and becomes trapped indoors. In the BTEX review paper we just published, um, toluene levels in outdoor air ranged from 7 to 27 micrograms per meter cubed. Indoors, they went as high as 326. And in personal sampling, they were about 14. In our samples, they were at 7 micrograms per meter cubed. So we did compare data for those who spent more or less time indoors in our sample, but we weren't able to draw any conclusions from that. We are going to look into that in further analysis, and we're going to consider doing more air sampling that's conducted entirely outdoors. Now, we tested for 16 PAHs, and naphthalene was the only one detected, and it was found in 62% of the samples. Naphthalene is a common air constituent and primarily released into the atmosphere from the combustion of wood and fossil fuels. It's also found near industrial and hazardous waste sites, in tobacco smoke, and sometimes used in mothballs these days. It used to be used in mothballs all the time. Um, very few air sampling studies of oil and gas measure PAHs which are very expensive to analyze. The slide lists, well, the, slide, the new slide lists the PAHs that were detected in Garfield County. You can't really see them in there. They're very tiny. But given the high levels that we found them in Garfield County, we're going to be sure to test for them again in follow-up sampling, and particularly, you know, follow-up sampling if oil and gas moves into this area. Of the most frequently detected chemicals, the light alkanes and ethylene, no, the light alkanes have few or no identified health effects. In contrast, toluene and naphthalene have effects in nearly all 12 health categories. And butane and ethylene also have a few health effects. So this is from the um, research that we had done earlier where we looked into the scientific literature on health effects. So that about sums up our findings. Overall, the number of chemicals identified was lower than Garfield County study, but some of them were in fairly high concentrations, particularly methane, the light alkanes, ethylene, and toluene. We're continuing to analyze the data and trying to find other comparison sites that would provide more comparable background levels, and we plan to publish a report in the near future. This project provided the DCR with a substantial platform of baseline data to be able to compare with future air monitoring results. Baseline air sampling is an extremely valuable tool that can both prevent future impacts of air pollution by promoting best practices, including regular air monitoring of industrial sites, and it can support remediation when incidents occur because we can show the levels that were present prior to oil and gas development. In addition, the procedures, pitfalls, and lessons learned during this pilot study are being documented for others to use. 
So first and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Theo Colborn for being the driving force behind this research and being for such a great influence in the Valley. I also want to thank the staff of TEDx, particularly Kim Schultz, who handles our gas program, the funders of TEDx, who support our oil and gas work, and of course, the board of CHC and Jim Ramey, who worked incredibly hard to bring this to fruition. And all the volunteers and volunteer coordinators who helped with the sampling study, you know who you are. Also, those who funded the study, including CHC members like yourselves, who donate to support this important work. And I want to close just by saying how proud I am to be a part of this small community, because there's really nothing small about what we're doing here. We are setting precedents in the way we block the proposed permits, well permits, in the way we force them to let us know who filed for the permits, and in this collection of baseline data, which is rare to my knowledge. So I say, let's see, keep setting precedents. Thank you. So, do you want to say that or let me say it? Jim said five minutes for questions. And just scream them out real loud and Carol rep will repeat it for you. Okay. No questions? The fracking tanks, yeah, the, he's asking if the fracking tanks just hold water or water in a cocktail mix. They're a mix of chemicals. They hold the chemicals that are used to, for the frack, and they hold the flow back when it comes up. Was there a question over here? We looked at weather data for our samples. Um, it's it's kind of complicated to account for wind speed, wind direction, things like that. We did collect the data. We haven't really um, analyzed it completely yet. Um, and I don't know about the uh, weather conditions for the other sites because they're part of like county data that's reported. And I don't think in that reporting they, they include the weather data. So you'd have to gather that from another source. That's a good question. Any other questions? Yeah, one down here front. This is a question, it's just a comment. I'm watching the, the dais that you're talking from. On the front of it, it goes in the steel. <laughs> it says hostage high bulldog. And it feels to me like that's what you and Theo have been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Barbara. She just compared us to bulldogs. <laughs> Hotchkiss bulldogs. We'll do our best. Yeah. Are you asking that as a question? So the question is, was, was the air data that was gathered um, in the comparison sites uh, using canisters as well? And my guess is that they were stationary sampling sites and they didn't use canisters, but I'm not entirely, entirely sure, and that's the next thing we're going to look into because that's our question about the ethylene values. Okay, over here. Yeah, so um, they said that his question was, what was the concern of the Oil and Gas Commission with our original studies? One of the concerns that I didn't mention was that they wanted us to do a better job with weather data. And we did do a better job with weather data this time, but we found that it is very complicated to analyze. So we're going to call in some other experts to help us on that. Um, and the other issue was that um, we had collected air samples from a stationary site that was at a residence but they said, you haven't proved that human beings were exposed to this air. You just proved that the sampling station was exposed. <laughs> it, it felt a little silly, but our response to them was to say, well, we can do better. They have, um, there are ways of collecting air 
that um, uses these backpacks and then the tubes come right there and they're sitting right there and you can't argue that a human being is not exposed to air that is right in their breathing zone. That's how they do occupational air sampling. Exactly, and that is, that is the issue with the way we did the sampling. We sort of then erred on the side of collecting the indoor data mixed with the outdoor data. So we're also looking into that, trying to separate out some of the, the people that were primarily indoors, people that were primarily outdoors, um, and looking specifically at what chemicals are typically found indoors and outdoors so we can separate them. It just requires some further analysis. Great. That's good. Oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, one last round of applause for Carol. We get a full slate today, but thank you, Carol.